The Roots album Things Fall Apart from 1999 is a great album, and there's one song in particular, one chord especially, that feels so good. In trying to understand why, I kept going, kept analyzing, looking at the larger context of this chord, this album, and The Roots as a band, and then I figured it out. This one chord kind of explains the roots and what they've managed to accomplish in the past nearly 25 years since its release. Here's where we're going. I'm gonna explore the root song, the next movement, break down the chords, the groove, the lyrics, trace it all the way back through music history and see how this single chord is the perfect encapsulation of what the roots are, believe, and continue to do today. Just remember this phrase, the roots are changing things. To understand the context that this mystery chord is in, we need to talk about the early days of The Roots. In 1987, drummer Amir Thompson, better known now as Questlove, and MC Tariq Trotter, aka Black Thought, began playing together in high school and formed a group that would eventually be called The Roots. After moving to London, The Roots released their debut record, Organics, independently in 1993. This album sounds very native tongues, very Tribe Called Quest. It's very jazz hip hop. I mean that in a very good way. It's like if Stetsasonic incorporated live instrumentation with their production and A Tribe Called Quest leaned heavily on jazz samples, Organics is taking both of those things and dialing it up to 11. This jazz hip hop style continued for their follow up and first major label release, Do You Want More? On the opening track, Black Thought introduces the album as organic hip hop jazz. Though with the addition of Scott Storch on Rhodes and Razelle beatboxing, the sound is beginning to expand. This album had a great response from critics and moderate commercial performance, but this jazz influence is coming into play later. Remember, we've got this one specific chord coming and this heavier jazz era of The Roots is a big part. The Roots sound would continue to expand on the next album, Illadelph Half-Life, though in a different direction. This album was released in 1996 and while it still has jazz elements, it sounds much harder more like Wu-Tang than Tribe. This album also had a great response from critics and moderate commercial performance, but by 1996, the hip hop landscape looked a lot different than when The Roots had started. Death Row and Bad Boy were the dominant forces in hip hop and The Roots were compared and contrasted with these giants on multiple occasions. For instance, Illadelph Half-Life was released in September 1996, just two weeks after Tupac was shot and killed, prompting the Philadelphia Inquirer to dub it the first major release of the post-Tupac Shakur era in rap. And while the reviewer loved the album, Quest says it was strange to be linked to Tupac's killing. Or there was the case of the music video for what they do. The Roots were making a parody of rap video cliches, but unintentionally upset Biggie, who took it as a personal attack on his video for one more chance. Before The Roots could respond to Biggie's statement about the video, Biggie was shot and killed. Now that we're roughly caught up with the history of The Roots up to this point, we can talk about where they're headed after that, about their next movement. The, the movement, but also the song. I know, you might be like, but what is the chord? And I'll tell you, it's a D flat. So there are two main sections to this song. This one, and this one. The contrast of these two sections is where the magic is. It's like the roots are holding our hands, showing us the old way and the next movement, right in front of our eyes with that D flat chord. But ah, we gotta keep going. We'll come back to that in just a second. The time between Illadelph Half-Life and their next album, Things Fall Apart, would prove to be an incredibly formative and influential time, not just for the roots, but eventually, basically all of American culture and beyond. But before that, The Roots felt unsettled. Their first major release, Do You Want More and Organics before that, were very jazz influenced, and on the other side, Illadelph Half-Life leaned the other way, toward harder hip hop. Both albums had critical success and moderate commercial success, but The Roots weren't sure what to do next. As Questlove remembers, I don't know whether we felt at the time like Things Fall Apart was our make or break record. That may be the hindsight talking, but we certainly felt like a gap was opening up between us and a certain segment of our audience namely the traditional hip-hop audience. After just two records, the second of which was fairly conservative by hip-hop standards, we were already feeling like we were on the margins. Not strangers in a strange land, but strangers in our own land. This would eventually culminate in their 1999 album, Things Fall Apart, but it all starts with this place of discomfort. Before we get the resolution, the roots are in this tension. 
And rather than take the traditional route, defaulting to the way it's always been, on Things Fall Apart, they decided to carve their own path, play their own chord. If you can't tell, I'm trying to foreshadow what's gonna happen with this chord, all right? Just roll with it. Questlove is like a musical encyclopedia. His knowledge and musical ability in so many genres of music is astounding. This led to an influence in The Roots, but also his own DJing, and oh, right, that reminds me. Questlove is auctioning off a handful of records from his personal collection for charity this Friday, April 7th, with proceeds going to the Future of Food program. And not only is he auctioning off the records, one person will win a chance to go record shopping with Questlove himself at A1 Records in New York in celebration of National Record Store Day. This live auction is happening on April 7th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the Whatnot app. And the in-person record store experience will be held on April 21st at A1 in New York. Whatnot has sponsored this video, but I'm also personally very excited about this. To participate, all you need to do is download the Whatnot app and join the at Questlove stream on April 5th at 5.30 p.m. PST. You can also bookmark the stream ahead of time and be notified when Quest goes live so you don't miss anything. He'll auction off a handful of his personal records. Again, proceeds are going to the Future of Food program, so this is a win-win. Then during the stream, Questlove will rant randomly select a winner to fly to New York and spend 45 minutes shopping with him on April 21st. If you're a Roots fan or a Questlove fan, you don't want to miss this. Here's something important. You need to have a WhatNot account in order to view the live stream and must be in the stream and present to win. Travel is included for the winner and one friend. This record store experience with Questlove will be streamed live on WhatNot and the stream bin section will be loaded with rare records from A1 Records. So go sign up for a WhatNot account, bookmark the stream, and get ready. All right, where were we? Oh, right. So the band is in this in-between period. They've musically leaned one way, leaned the other, and been compared to, but not fully accepted by mainstream hip-hop. Unsure of where to go to next, they decided to return to their roots. Yeah, I heard it, there it is. The Roots' manager, Richard Nichols, knew exactly what the band needed, so he convinced the label to pay for two 15-passenger vans and a chef. They began hosting jam sessions at Questlove's house on St. Albans in South Philly. Soon, these jam sessions were bursting with talented singers, musicians, and MCs. We're talking Jill Scott, Music Soulchild, Bilal, India Ari, Jasmine Sullivan, and many more would perform at these jam sessions. These sessions were exciting, creative, and loud, prompting Quest to call the police to come shut down the party at his own house. Nearly 20 artists from these jam sessions would eventually get record contracts, and as Questlove put it, if hip hop had died at the 1995 Source Awards, I felt like something new was being born on St. Albans. These jam sessions were the starting point for a new generation of artists and breathed new inspiration into the roots, and Questlove in particular. Around this time is when he met up with D'Angelo, began working on Voodoo, and formed the Soulquarians Collective, which is its own scene. But I've already done a whole series of videos on that, so for more on that story, you'll have to go check those out. So now we're at Things Fall Apart, and this album was a breakthrough for The Roots. It's a balance of both of their previous sounds, as well as new influences they picked up along the way, like these St. Albans jam sessions, and rolled it all into something new. In addition, Questlove in particular was hanging around producers like Jay Dilla, DJ Premier, and Q-Tip, which pushed him in his own production. The name of the album, Things Fall Apart, comes from the novel of the same name that's about a Nigerian man who returns to his village to see that the only constant is change. His cultural traditions were being wiped away in exchange for Western ways. This is what Quest felt was happening in hip hop and where the roots sat within them. So the song The Next Movement is near the beginning of the album and is setting up what you're about to hear throughout the rest of it. Lyrically, Black Thought is rhyming about the, I mean, the next movement, saying that the whole state of things in the world is about to change and that the roots are ushering in this whole thing. His verses are incredible and, I mean, he was right. We'll talk about how in just a moment, but first we gotta talk about what's going on musically and why this D flat chord that I've been teasing this whole time is such a big deal. There are two main musical sections to this song and it goes back and forth between throughout. First we've got the D flat to C minor. This D flat chord is the key to the whole thing, but we'll come back to that in just a second. This is the main groove of the song, this D flat sliding to the C minor. The rhythm here is syncopated, kind of funky and feels great. Then we get to the other section which is more straightforward, just C minor. G, G7, back to C minor. The rhythm here is more straightforward too, just holding each chord for half a bar. And then it's back to the D flat, C minor section. 
So let's unpack this because reducing an entire band and movement down to just one chord might seem crazy. Are you ready for a quick music theory tangent? Okay, so there's these musical devices called cadences. It's a fancy word that just means how you resolve a chord at the end of a phrase. There are different types of cadences, but we're gonna focus on the authentic cadence. This really just means it's a five chord resolving to the one. For instance, in the key of C major, this would mean a G resolving to a C. The perfect authentic cadence is when it's resolving from five to one and the root note of each chord is in the bass voice. So for example, that G to C in the left hand, I'm gonna go G down to C. And I say bass voice because that's the lowest on the keyboard here, but if you're playing bass too, that would just be G to C. These cadences have been around for a very long time. Bach loves himself a perfect authentic cadence. It's a very strong, very clear sounding resolution. Here we are with a little bit of tension and then it resolves all very clearly. The reason why this sounds so strong and clear is because the five chord has some tension in it and wants to resolve to the one. Let me show you what I mean. So we're in the key of C. That C major chord is our home bass. I'm inverting this, I'm just putting the G on the bottom, but C, E, G right there. Western trained ears want to return to that C major. You can go anywhere you want from here, but your ear just really wants to resolve back to that C. It just feels right, it's a resolution. So the five chord, G in this case, is made up of three notes, G, B, and D. This chord especially wants to resolve to the C. The C is made up of C, E, and G. Now, I'll tell you what, for the sake of simplicity, let's kick this G down an octave right here. Same chord, we're just inverting it. Now let's go back to that G chord. Each of these notes is very close to the notes of a C chord. In changing, the G stays the same, the B resolves a half step up to that C, and the D goes up to that E, just a whole step. It's so close to being a C, it's just a couple steps away, but the root note in the bass, the perfect part of the authentic cadence, that's actually pretty far from C. So the root is kind of far away, but the individual notes up here don't have to move much. It's kind of like a musical illusion. It feels far, but the resolution is actually pretty close. You could say the same thing about the roots at this moment in their history. Again, with the foreshadowing, okay, just roll with it. Now, we've been talking about G to C major. If you add a seven on top and make it a G7, this tension and release effect is even stronger. The song, the next movement is actually in C minor and minor keys work a little differently, but the same basic concept applies. This G wants to resolve to the home base, C minor. Authentic cadences have been around for a long time. They're a reliable way to bring some conclusion to the music, but there is another way to do the same thing, but in an inverted way, the tritone substitution. The tritone sub can be found in classical music, but is probably best known for being used in jazz music. Here's the basic concept. The most important note in any chord is the root. Like you can't have a G7 without first having a G. The next most important note is the third. This determines if it's major or minor. In a G7, that's B, the major third. After that, most important is actually the seven because that adds additional texture to it. A G7 has a minor seven in there, or an F. After that, there is a D in there, which is kind of take it or leave it. So let's take it out for now. That's our root, third, and seventh. Remember how the G is the most important note in this chord? Well, what if we kept these other important notes, the B and the F, but changed the G? That interval from B to F is known as a tritone, so what if we also went a tritone away from that G? be a D flat. That's about as far away from G as you can get before you start coming back. That seems like a random note that shouldn't work, but watch what happens. Now, by just swapping out the root note, we've gone from a G7 to a D flat 7. And even though this chord is not in the key of C minor, it has the same tendency to want to resolve down to C. The B and the F are still in the chord and still wanting to resolve to that C. And for the root, instead of going such a big leap like this, it's just a half step away. That D flat is sliding down a half step. So it almost works even better. Now, this is not an authentic cadence, yet it still works just as well. 
That D flat might sound wrong at first, but once it resolves, it all makes sense. You could also say the same thing about the roots at this moment in their history. Here's what I mean. We've got this D flat resolving down to a C minor a half step away. We've got this tension and then this release. Rhythmically, this part is syncopated, a little funkier and it feels great. And to me, this feels like the roots making a statement about who they are and what they're doing. It's jazzy, it's sly, it's funky, it's hip hop. After leaning very jazz on their early stuff and more hard hip hop on Ill Delph Half-Life, this song is now perfecting the middle ground with this D flat chord. It's jazzy, but not overly so. It's hip hop, but not like any other artist the roots were compared to. Bass wise too, it's resolving D flat to C, but there's a G in between. It's like Hub is holding our hand and being like, I know this D flat's weird. Let me take it to somewhere where you know G is basically the same thing, and then we're gonna resolve it to that C minor. On this album, the roots have perfected this balance and this chord is the perfect encapsulation of that. But then we keep going and contrast that with the second part. That's just C minor to G, G7 back to C minor. As we just learned, that's basically a perfect authentic cadence, the standard way of doing things, the most by the book way of doing things, the mainstream way of doing things. You understand what I'm saying, right? The song, The Next Movement, is all about how the roots are changing things. The roots as in the band, I mean. They're changing hip hop and they're changing the larger culture. But also, the roots are changing things, and this time I mean the roots of the chords. All you have to do is change that G to a D flat and the whole thing shifts. The band is showing their version of a resolution, the D flat to C minor. Then to make the difference clear, they show the conventional way of resolving it, the old way that we're all used to and are now coming out of. With this song and this album, we're finally getting the resolution, not only musically, but metaphorically. Things Fall Apart was a huge album for The Roots. It was met with critical acclaim as well as commercial success, charted well, and earned the band their first Grammy. But the next movement was bigger than that. The movement, not the song. This album is a classic Soulquarians album, along with D'Angelo's Voodoo, Common's Like Water for Chocolate, Erica Badu's Mama's Gun. Oh, and that also includes Jay Dilla, who produced with all of these artists, including another Roots song. Also, plenty of other releases from artists that came out of the St. Albans Jam Sessions, Jill Scott, Music Soul Child, and more. Keep going. The Roots back up Jay-Z on his Unplugged album from 2001 and in 2003 for his show with The Garden and documentary Fade to Black. They're the house band for Dave Chappelle's Block Party in 2006. The Roots and their influence are spreading everywhere. This is the next movement. Oh, right, and they're still releasing albums. Phrenology 2002, The Tipping Point 2004, Game Theory 2006, Rising Down 2008. They've done an album with John Legend, an album with Elvis Costello. And in 2009, they became the house band for Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. And in 2014, when Jimmy took over for The Tonight Show, this made The Roots the house band for the world's longest running talk show, a legendary show. This is the next movement. Not only the Roots' ascent as a hip hop band, but as part of a larger musical and cultural movement. So many artists, everyone I've named so far, has been directly impacted by the Roots and have flourished in a family tree, if you will. And Questlove has become his own massive cultural figure, not only as a musician and producer, but as a DJ, music historian, cultural curator, filmmaker, the list goes on and on. This album took a few months to go gold at 500,000 copies sold and 14 years to hit platinum for a million copies. That's a good thing. It's a slower burn, showing how timeless this album is. It's not following a trend or trying to sell as many copies as possible. It's art with a capital A, and good art like this lasts and ages well. So the roots change things, the band and the court. Incredible music, massive influence, a classic album, and for me, it all boils down to this D flat. On Things Fall Apart, the roots perfected this unique balance of jazz and hip hop, live band, interesting chords, lyricism, and helped start a new movement. Here's the traditional way, and here's our way. One of those traditional ways in hip hop is sampling, which while the roots sometimes use samples, they rely more heavily on their live instrumentation. But there's another song to talk about on Things Fall Apart, Dynamite. It's produced by Jay Dilla and the sample used could be traced back through a crazy web of sampling and music rights. In 100 years, this one song goes all over the place and ultimately ends up traveling one mile. But for that story, 
you gotta watch this video.